The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, Typebond, and today's special sponsor, Doghouse Systems. So today I'm gonna to show you how I made my new gaming desk. It's made of solid walnut, features a really cool RGB strip here because what's a modern computer rig without RGB, right? Uh, and it's powered by my new Doghouse Systems PC. All right, so let's head to the shop and I'll show you the details. So basically what we're looking at here is a trestle table adapted to a desk format. I've kind of off-centered the sides to push everything back a little bit, making more room for the knees. I cut a nice little curve in the front here that just makes it more comfortable to kind of nestle in there. And then dog-eared the corners because, I don't know, style points and it doesn't really need a sharp corner there. Uh, I even in the back have a little tray for cable management that should help. You could put a power strip up there, all those annoying little component uh, and power blocks, you can put those there and they'll be out of the way. And from this view, everything will be nice and clean. Uh, now, the reason I decided to build my own, I, I looked at some gaming desks out there and most of them are just, I don't know, they just look cheap. They've got like carbon fiber, uh, which is kind of cool looking, but the carbon fiber layers on top of MDF. Um, I really couldn't find something that made me feel good about spending money on it. So I figured, you know what? Let me try to make something that kind of feels like one of those gaming desks, but is made out of wood. Maybe it's just a little bit more classy and uh, unfortunately winds up costing me a lot more money than one of those gaming desks would have. But in the end, I think I'm much happier with these results now. The top. The top is a bit of a challenge. You will see me go through some interesting things with this, but the first challenge uh, is to determine how this acrylic is going to bond to the wood itself. All right, so I'm not totally confident at this point in how epoxy is going to adhere to the plexiglass and then the other side with the walnut on there. So I really wanna do a test. I wanna see how well this works just to make myself feel a little bit better. So I've got a thin piece of plexi, two scrap pieces of walnut here, and we're gonna glue them together. Now, one thing I think would be a good idea is to sand the plexiglass just to give it a mechanical tooth. It'll cloud it up, but we don't care what it looks like. We don't need to see through it this way. Hopefully that'll give the glue something to bond to. Now the epoxy I'm using is Total Boat and I like to buy it in these big jugs. Uh, the reason is because it just lasts for a really long time and I have the advantage of these little squeezy hoochies that actually meter out the exact amount of material that I need. So I don't even have to think about the ratio because these little guys give me exactly what I need every time. And by the way, I get a lot of questions about which hardener I like to use. Most of the time, if I go to epoxy, it's something that I want more time to work with, so I will go with the slow hardener over the fast, most of the time. All right, so this doesn't have to be perfect. I just wanna get some glue on there. It's gonna be messy. Okay, get these together. And they're gonna to wanna to slip. Definitely can be an issue. Tighten it down real nice. And I'll just let this guy sit overnight. We'll check back in tomorrow. All right, so this test piece has had an overnight dry time. And as far as adhesion goes, I think we're gonna be fine. That epoxy is pretty strong stuff. I don't really see any way that we could pull these apart, but we are gonna to torture the crap out of this thing. I've never really worked with plexiglass in this manner, so I wanna make sure that it cuts well, that I could hit it with a router bit. Uh, I wanna see how it sands. I wanna hit it with the bandsaw. Uh, if there's any sort of breakage or splintering that occurs, that's gonna be a bit of a problem. Uh, so we have to torture this first to make sure this is gonna work before we make our desktops. All right, that went really well. Uh, we got some saw marks in there, but this would all sand out. I don't see any chip out or any real problems. So at least a good straight saw blade cut is gonna be no problem at all. All right, once again, great result. Nice clean cut, even with the bandsaw. And once again, nice clean result. So this is all looking pretty good. All right, so that was a great test and just kind of a positive indication to me that it's, it's safe to proceed. Now, those of you who maybe work in plastics all the time, you're like, yeah, no duh, this is, <laughs> this is how this stuff works, but I don't work in plastics. And I think it's really important to test these things for yourself before you proceed on a project that involves new materials. Outside of maybe running it over with a, with a truck or beating it with a sledgehammer, I don't know what we're gonna prove other than the fact that these pieces are really well stuck together. All right, so at this point, let's proceed with selecting the material for our tops. 
Now, I say this all the time, walnut is a little bit tricky, especially when you buy the thinner material. You got a lot of sapwood, you got a lot of knots. I just think it's easiest most of the time to embrace the chaos, and that means including some of those things. And don't look at them as flaws, you know, wood is a natural product. It looks pretty cool to incorporate those things, and you'll see we'll try to do it in a way that makes sense and that actually looks pretty good. So we do have some nice material here, and I know what we're going to be doing is thinning these down so that we could have a top skin and a bottom skin, but I'm kind of just looking at the top skins, and I am building two desks. So I want to essentially pick enough material so I have two beautiful tops. Now for the underside skins, I don't really care what those look like. I do want it to be walnut, but if it's got a lot of knots and it isn't very attractive, then that goes on the underside. Right, so we're just going to pick out some boards and try to lay out for two tops. All right, so after a whole lot of fussing and cutting these boards down, I think I have an arrangement that looks pretty good. And at this point, with a target dimension of 24 inches wide, uh, these are really rough boards. And I know that once I do the milling, I'm going to cut them down. I'm going to lose a lot of this width. So at this rough stage, I want to make sure I have more than 24. And I'm a little bit under 28. And I think that's pretty good. So I've got my two top skins. That's my best material. And then my secondary material that I don't think looks as good for the two bottom skins. I got a lot of milling to do, so I'm going to hit the jointer and planer. So I'm going to spare you guys the agony of watching me do all that milling, but just know that I brought these guys down to a little bit over a half inch. Ultimately, I want to be about at a inch and a quarter in final thickness with the acrylic layer in the middle. And now one series at a time. Okay, we have four of these to do, two desks, two skins for each desk. I'm going to do one panel at a time, gluing it up and getting it ready for the final glue up as a sandwich. All right, let's take this over to the assembly table. Now before I glue these up, I actually wound up adding some dominoes in there. I really want some help with alignment here. These boards are fairly thin and I'm kind of concerned that because these are essentially are going to be part of a sandwich in the future, if the pieces are offset during the glue up, it's really going to mess things up for that glue layer. So having dominoes, biscuits, whatever you have, dowels, uh, to help keep things aligned is actually really, really helpful on panels like this that are this thin. And before I glue these together, we need to have a chat. Something I really hadn't thought about, and I don't know if it's because I just came back from vacation and my head's not totally in the game, I was so focused on this LED lighting concept that I didn't really think through the woodworking aspect. And we kind of have a bit of a problem because this panel, even though it's only a half inch thick, is still acting as a solid panel, which means it's going to expand and contract. When we glue that to a substrate that is not going to expand and contract like a piece of plastic, you could very well have wood movement problems. That means cracking, splitting, detaching, delaminating, all kinds of things can go wrong if there are dramatic changes in humidity that cause the top and bottom skins to move while the core doesn't move. So I have to give this a lot of thought and decide what I want to do. There are a lot of better ways to do this. You could certainly use plywood for the top and bottom with solid wood edging. Um, you know, you could just glue the front and secure the back with screws to allow the back to float. I have given it some thought, I've talked to a number of people about this, and given where I am in Denver, very low humidity, and kind of stays that way all year long, I actually am going to take a bit of a gamble here. I normally don't do this with my furniture, but it's for me, and if it gets messed up, I happen to know a guy who can make a new top, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, I'm going to go forward with the epoxy, I'm going to epoxy the crap out of this thing, and see what happens, and I will report back. But I don't want it to go out there as me condoning this as a, a legit method for, for building something like this. I think there are better ways that would allow for wood movement, but I'm very interested to see, over time, does this hold up, or does it implode, or am I just really lucky, or maybe I'm lucky, I don't know, we'll see. So we'll see how it goes. I'm a little bit nervous to completely ignore a wood movement rule that, I, that I've known for years, but we'll see what happens. Dominoes are way more fun if you put them in with a baby hammer. Just a nice bead of glue along the edge. And by the way, if you don't want to do dominoes or whatever for alignment, um, you can just go for it and hopefully your boards are all flat enough that they kind of stay in line with one another or you can use calls. You can get strips of hardwood, one on each side, sandwich it together and that kind of will clamp everything nice and flat. And by the way, I do have a video on uh, 
some tips for making nice wide flat panels that you might want to check out. I'll put the link in our description for you. And how do you know when you've added enough glue to a joint? Well, pretty much when you see a nice even bead of squeeze out all the way across. Now with our top and bottom skin cleaned up, we're pretty much ready for the glue up, but we need to prep this panel. It's a little bit too big, right? That was intentional. But if, it's, uh, if we put this in our veneer press, which is what we're gonna use to press these together, that amount of pressing power, if there's too much of an overhang, it could wind up bending and breaking something. So we wanna get rid of the overhangs. The easiest way to do that is to get your plexi pl uh, panel, pl plexi planel, center it, and now on the width, I've got about an eighth of an inch on each side. That's actually perfect. Any more than that, and I think you get a little bit risky for causing yourself some problems. So I'm just gonna line it up so I'm well within the boundaries here. Grab my Sharpie, strike a line there, and one over here. And now we can cut those. Now, before we do our glue up, we have to think about the glue that we're using and how these materials work. So the piece of plexiglass is smooth. It's not porous, right? So a glue can't really absorb into it. So you really, in those cases, want to give a mechanical tooth to the surface. You want that glue to have something to bite into and to bind to. So the way we're going to do that is with sanding. I'm just going to take 100 grit with my random orbit sander, scratch it all up. It's going to look like crap. It'll get very cloudy, but that cloudiness is just a small scratch pattern, and that allows the glue to have something to bite into. Now, on the wood side, it's no problem. The glue will absorb into the wood and should bind just fine. Once that's done, flip it over, repeat it on the other side. Once this is done, you will have a little bit of surface dust. Go ahead and just vacuum that off. All right, I mixed up a bunch of epoxy. I just broke my mixing stick. This is where my terrible spreading skills come in. And what I'm really looking for here is a nice layer. I don't want to see any dry spots and the pressure will squeeze out what we don't need in the joint. I think we're getting there. I saw a couple of light dry spots here, so I'm just hitting it with a little bit more of the epoxy all the way out to the edges and corners. Okay, bring on the plastic. So now the blue tape, this is something that we do in veneering that works there we go, really well, is it just kind of stabilizes things and helps it not move as much. Just kind of go around, tape up the border. Now there's a plastic netting on top of here, and that actually is gonna help with airflow. The bottom board here that we're supported on has grooves in it, and again, airflow when we pull a vacuum, or what will suffice as a vacuum. All right, so let's seal this bad boy up. Pop on the sealer, hoochie. So just to reiterate, what we've got here is a bottom platform. This is made from MDF, and I have a groove structure in there that just kind of allows the air to pull out from under this workpiece as we pull the vacuum. This little valve here, this connector that connects to the pump, sits on top, and we need something to allow air to get in there. That's how the air is leaving the bag. So we put it over this wire mesh, and the wire mesh, well, it's not wire, but you know what I mean. It's a mesh material, plastic mesh, um, that also allows it to pull a vacuum over the rest of the board pretty consistently. All right, and of course we use this guy to close it all off. The pump over here, uh, a continuous duty pump that uh, works really well. It does take a 220, which was kind of um, a drawback years ago when I first bought it because I didn't have much 220 in the shop, but uh, no problem now. And all I have to do is connect this to the bag, pop that sucker on there, and then I plug it in. There's no on off switch. You just plug it in and go. And then I will leave this, I'm probably gonna leave this overnight. Mm. 
All right, after an overnight cure period, I've let the air back in. We can see the results. All right, plexiglass looks good. Epoxy is nice and cured. It's very firm. That turned out really good, and thankfully we didn't have a ton of squeeze out to contend with, so this, this top is done. Of course, we have to do the shaping now, and I actually have a second one of these to do, because again, two desks. So one thing I wanna show you real quick is you see that little spot of epoxy there? The cool thing is when you pull a vacuum like that, even with half inch thick material, if there's a knot or some kind of a crack that goes all the way through, it tends to suck the adhesive up through it and actually expose it at the surface. It's that powerful. Um, this happens in veneering all the time, but I was actually kind of surprised to see it happen in half inch thick material. Pretty cool. All right, so now I'm gonna trim this guy down to final size and shape. I'm gonna try to retain as much of the plexiglass shape as possible because that's two by four and that's my final size. I'll trim the tops to width at the table saw. Then I can use the track saw for a cut on each end. The top has a nice little curve cutout, so I'll make a plywood template first. I cut as close to the line as possible and then clean up with some sanding. Now at each front corner, I measure in a few inches for the 45 degree cuts. The curve will go between those lines. I'll cut as close to the line as I dare at the bandsaw. Now for a piece this large, a roller stand is a really good idea. Using the template, I can line it up and use a flush trim bit to establish the final shape. This bit isn't long enough to do it all in one pass, so I'll remove the template and finish it with a second round of cuts. Using the track saw, I'll trim the front corners. Now we need to talk about the LEDs because this is really the unknown area for me. I don't work with LED lighting very much, not in this capacity. Uh, so trying to figure out where to put them, how to get the best you know, light travel through this top so that we get that nice diffuse light at the front, it's a big challenge. And I destroyed my top, uh, the underside. And it's okay, because I consider that my practice run. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but let me take you through the process that I went through here. So I had a Hue light strip. This is just what I happen to have on hand. I used the Hue system, so I thought it would be nice to start here. And what I did was I put the strip at the back, hoping that even though this is 24 inches, my initial test that I did showed that the light would go through that. Uh, I put that at the back and I was not really happy with the results. Number one, it was pretty dim. I really wanted to, I don't want this thing to, you know, to be crazy bright, but I do want to see it, right? And I also want to be able to see it off axis. And what I noticed, especially if you go into the colors like blues and reds, you really got to get down on a level with it to be able to see anything. So ultimately, this was not going to work for me. So then I went on the crazy quest of searching the internet for different types of LEDs. Uh, so getting something with more uh, LED diodes in it was something I thought would help, right? Because then you have more light intensity total, uh, you have more light overall. Um, and if you go to different colors, you know, maybe it would just be a little bit brighter. Um, so you could take a look at the differences here. And I might be mistaken on the numbers here, but I think the hue is at about like 30 LEDs per meter. And this strip that I purchased is 60. Now, unfortunately, it still made no difference. You could still see each individual LED all the way through once you were on level and it was still kind of dim. So I had to come up with a different plan. And that is when I used my first tabletop as a test bed. Take a look. So what I decided to do is route a channel on the inside here. And this would hopefully allow me to bring my LED strip down and center the LEDs right on the center of the plexiglass. Now that did work. It was much, much brighter. It looked pretty good. The problem is, once again, no diffusion here. So anything I did to try to help with the diffusion in this sort of context here just would not work. You could still see all of the individual lights. And uh, that's when my buddy Jory, Jory Brigham, wonderful craftsman, came up with uh, this solution. Uh, this is a, I don't know how new these are, but it's definitely a little bit different. It's an LED strip light that they refer to as like a neon style. And the idea behind this is it is pre-diffused. It's a fairly nice, even color distribution all the way across, and you cannot see the individual LEDs. So after all of this testing, and you could see over here, I did a number of tests back filled with epoxy. The underside of this particular table is gonna look like duty, but it is what it is. Uh, so what I determined is if we just route a channel and then we could take this little neon guy, drop it into that channel, as long as we're not too far from the edge, it's still very, very bright, 
nice and even colored and I think this is going to give us the best results that we can hope for. So we're going to, <laughs> we're going to have to do this one too. This one's going to look awful, but hopefully it'll look a little bit nicer on um, the other top. Now, as you can see, this is a nice diffuse color. It's glowing perfectly. I've got actually the preferred color for me is blue here, um, but certainly any other RGB color is gonna look nice. Uh, it's as intense as I could ask it to be, and if I wanna make it a little bit more dim, we've got that control to dim it. So I think that's a huge success. That is definitely gonna work, but I do wanna show you one thing. This is the underside of the desk. So this will create a bit of a glow on the underside too. And if that bothers you, you're gonna to wanna to do something to block that off. Uh, I don't think it's that big of a deal, just having a blue cast under the desk, but you could certainly close that off if you want to. Also keep in mind, I know some of you are looking at this going, wow, imagine if that was the top top, right? The top surface. So you have this kind of blue inlay going around the perimeter. If that's something you want, and you don't mind doing a permanent fix here, you could just kind of fill this in with epoxy that would lock it in place, but that would certainly give you this kind of blue perimeter inlay. All right, so something to think about, but definitely mission accomplished regarding that diffused color pattern that we're looking for. So the only other things we need to do to our top now is all the finishing touches, right? These are very sharp edges here, so we're gonna to wanna to sand everything down, add some profiles that not only make it look good, but also make it more comfortable. Think about if you're gaming on here, a lot of times your wrists and arms come into contact with this front edge. So I'm gonna put a more substantial round over on the front, but everywhere else, top and bottom, we're gonna put a small eighth inch round over. And I think I'll go maybe with a half inch round over right in here. A card scraper is a great tool for removing mill marks. I still sand, but the card scraper means that I could jump right to 180 and make a lot less dust. We actually sell these bad boys in the Wood Whisperer store. That's at TWWstore.com. Now the finish is a hard wax oil, and there's really no reason not to finish it at this point. We interrupt this program for a special bulletin. I want to tell you about our friends at Doghouse Systems. Nicole and I bought our first doghouse PCs way back in 2008. Not gonna lie, we kinda felt like badasses, even though we only played World of Warcraft at the time. In 2012, I treated Nicole to a brand new doghouse system with some custom art by our buddy Scott Johnson. And this year, I finally got a big upgrade. I went to the doghouse website, picked the system level that I wanted, and then configured my dream PC. So what did I end up with? It's a Corsair Crystal Series 570X RGB case outfitted with an Asus Maximus Hero motherboard, an Intel i7-10700K 8-core 3.8 GHz CPU, and 16 gigs of Kingston HyperX RAM. And yes, that's an RTX 3090 GPU. So much overkill. And by the way, Doghouse currently has GPUs in stock and ready to ship with new machines. If none of this terminology makes any sense to you, let me translate. It plays games good. And here at The Wood Whisperer, we work even harder than we play. And Doghouse makes incredibly powerful workstations for creatives. This is our editor Todd's new rig, and frankly, the specs bring a tear to my eye. Building your own PC is awesome for those with the knowledge and the time, but I don't have either of those right now, and Doghouse always has my back. I get a killer PC built to my specs that comes with a warranty and great service. Just head to doghousesystems.com and use the code WOODWHISPER at checkout to receive a free one terabyte SSD upgrade. All right, so now that the tops are finished, we could start to work on the base. And I've got all my material here for both desks 
rough cut. Uh, we're using eight quarter for those horizontal pieces. We've got some six quarter for the rails that connect the two side assemblies. And then we have um, six quarter for the verticals that make up part of those side assemblies. All right, so things are kind of rough cut now, but I'm gonna do the final milling and bring them down to final size. All right, so with all these base parts milled up, the next thing we need to do is think about the joinery. Now, there's a lot of different ways you could accomplish this, but because my vertical sections of the sides are gonna have a gap between them, it's kind of a cool thing to do if we have a shallow half lap, right? So our long stretcher will come along, it'll receive its own little half lap uh, groove or dado is what it would be called. Uh, and these other two pieces, the verticals will come up into that and together they'll make a nice strong joint. It'll also, it's very important, the order that we're doing things now, um, by doing this first, it helps us position the vertical so that later when we do our mortise and tenon joints into the top and bottom, these are now in a fixed position. So it's gonna be really helpful. Uh, so we will be cutting the half lap in both the vertical pieces and the long horizontal piece. And we will start with that first. So for the table saw setup, what I have is a three quarter inch dado stack. It's about an eighth of an inch above the table. And then I have my table saw fence positioned an inch from the right side of the blade. And this should get us started with our first cut. We'll then reposition the fence to get the second side of that cut as we sneak up on the fit. So with our first dado cut in place, we can now do the second one. And I'm just gonna put my adjoining vertical workpiece right up against that wall and then draw a line. This is just a rough estimate that I could use for setting up my fence. So I'm just gonna scooch the fence over. I'm gonna stay within that line though, because I don't wanna really nail it in the first shot, because chances are I'll overshoot. So I'd rather be conservative here. And then we'll sneak up on it. And here is the kind of fit we're looking for. Just slides right in there. Now, one thing to keep in mind is this piece has been sanded to its final grit. That can affect the thickness of your work pieces, so don't use a rough piece when you put it in there. Make sure you have one that's pretty close to being ready for finish and test with that. Now, to cut that little dado on the verticals, we have to have the vertical pieces on their sides like this, and we've adjusted the fence so we have our top down distance. We'll make our first cut, go through all of our uh, vertical side pieces, and then we'll make a, another adjustment to establish the other end of the cut, very similar to what we just did. All right, so now let's talk about the joinery. I'm going with loose mortise and tenons here via the domino. I've got 10 by 80s. That's probably gonna be a good size so that we don't go too deep into our top and bottom pieces, uh, but still giving us plenty of support. So here's how I'm kind of rationalizing the spacing. I want these to be centered here, and I want at least a little bit of material, maybe a quarter inch between the two, and a decent amount of material on the outside edges. And it's you know kind of a tight fit, but I think it'll work out quite nicely. The key here, with the domino, at least for the way I use it, is I put a set of layout marks and then I just transfer those marks to other parts of the project. That just makes things a whole lot easier. All right, so I'm gonna center these the way I think looks good, set up a square, and then we'll be off. There, and I am marking these on the outside face. Now to transfer these marks to our bottoms and our tops, we need to be able to get this thing together and clamped so we can actually have the boards in their final positions. So I've got the base upside down now and I've drawn a line on, this just happens to be one of my bottom pieces, uh, measuring the distance from the back to what the center line of this assembly should be. I'm gonna use that mark to dictate where this thing is gonna line up by simply putting the pencil mark between the legs like this. 
Now, one way you can double check yourself here is to flip the piece around. If everything is as symmetrical as we expect it to be, this should fit in both orientations. All right, and those line up pretty nicely. And now transferring these marks to the rest of the pieces is a piece of cake. Make them nice and flush at the end. Don't have to use a clamp, but I find that to be a little bit more reliable. And then I just transfer across to the other piece. Now once you have another piece marked, you don't want to use this piece to mark the rest. You keep using the same piece and that will help to uh, eliminate, at least mostly reduce, error. And we can also use this to mark up our top horizontal pieces. Because our top and bottom pieces are the same length, this is easy. If they were different lengths, because that's what the design called for, it would be a little bit harder to keep track of these things. All right, now if this worked out, these guys should line up perfectly. All right, looking good. The top supports and the feet both receive tapers. No real reason other than a stylistic choice. The underside of the feet will also have a nice little cutout, which will lighten the appearance of the foot and give it two contact points with the floor. I make the cuts at the bandsaw and then clean things up at the workbench. Now the outside edges of the leg will receive a nice symmetrical round over just to soften the appearance. The bit isn't perfect in how it profiles the edge, so it takes a little bit of sanding to get it nice and smooth. And now everything gets a little sanding. You know, there's, a, there's something kind of cute about this clip. So one of the parts got a nice dent in it, and we'll use some steam to fix it. The steam will swell the fibers, and it allows us to scrape and sand the surface, and basically the flaw just disappears. Mostly. Now everything gets a nice little round over. The top supports need some holes for screws. I first counter bore, and then drill a smaller hole that goes all the way through. It's a good idea to rock the drill back and forth a little bit to elongate the hole so that it allows the top to move if the top was going to move. We'll also need some plugs to cap off those holes later, so I'll drill those now. As we gear up for assembly, anything we can do to save time, it's a good idea to do it. So when doing loose mortise and tendon joints like this, uh, dominoes or however you wanna make them, it's a good idea to install these in the rail pieces, make them a pre-glued part of the rail, and it just makes things go so much faster during the final assembly. And just a little tip for the domino, if you're having trouble getting the dominoes to go in, there's a little rib on the outside of each domino. If you sand or plane that away, these things will slide in and they'll almost be loose. So you have to be careful how much you do that. But in this case, I want these guys to be as just as tight as possible because I want them to stay nice and straight. If I loosen it too much, they might skew which will be a problem on the next half of the assembly. As they're bottom down, then we could just clean off the squeeze out. That's done. All right, so part in the mask, it's a whole pandemic thing, but uh, we're gonna do the glue up now. Uh, we're gonna use two people to get this done. I think it'll be a lot faster to do both sides at the same time. If you're doing something like this alone though, I would just do one side at a time, let the other side just kind of hang out in space, uh, do one at a time and then move to the other. And even still, uh, we're going to use Type Bond Extend to give us a little bit more working time. The lap joints get a good amount of glue. The joint isn't really that deep, but between the glue and the snug fit, it's going to be really strong. 
We'll clamp those together first, and then work on the top supports and the feet. I have to say, I love having a helper in a shop. It really makes glue-ups a lot less stressful. Okay, so at this point, I think we're just going to let it set up for a little bit. We do have some squeeze out to contend with, but uh, I think I'd rather scrape it away once it's kind of set up as opposed to using a wet rag. So we'll let it sit for a little bit. So now we can do a little bit of finishing. I'm going to use a hard wax oil. It's one that I go to these days, one of my favorite finishes. That'll give it a nice warm appearance without building a real thick film. Um, we've already got some finish on the top. Basically, you do the bottom and the top. Do the bottom first so that when you have to flip it over, the side that you don't see all the time is, is touching the surface. And then the finished pretty side is facing up. Um, so those are already done. Thankfully, they'll be fully cured by the time we attach the base to the top. But for now, we got to get finish all over this base piece. Same finish as before, a hard wax oil. I'll pop in the LED strip, and although the fit is pretty snug, I'm going to use some hot glue in dabs to help keep the strip from falling out in the future. Alright, so with the base in position, I'm flush at the back here, I can pre-drill, and I've already got my screw holes in these horizontal pieces, but it's a good idea to extend that hole with a small bit. Doesn't have to be too far. Now, because of this slope and the slope in the back, I actually wound up using like three different size screws. So it's really gonna depend on how much you counter bore and the angle you choose here. Um, but I just don't wanna punch too far into the top. Now, if you don't want to, you don't have to cover these counter bore holes, but I do have those little tapered plugs. So what I'm going to do is tap them in, get them the bottom out, and pressure is just going to hold it in place. So we'll trim this flush, and I'm just going to leave it dry because if I ever need to get at these screws to do something with the top, uh, they won't be held in with glue, they'll just be pressure fit. I don't want to mangle this too much. So I'll put a piece of blue tape down, which probably won't stick real good to this freshly oiled surface, but whatever. Just something that I could rest this guy on. Just kind of sand them nice and flush. And with finish, it's kind of blend right in and pretty nice for something that I can pop out and replace the top if I need to. Now as tempted as I am to flip this thing over and just bask in the glory of my beautiful new gaming desk, I still have one more thing to do. Uh, anybody who has set up a desk and sort of painstakingly arranged your components quickly realizes that cable management can make or break the setup, right? So having something integrated into the table that allows me to manage the cables, to put a power strip in place or put all the little bricks that come with things that we have to plug in, give it a safe place to go, uh, I think it's gonna go a long way for organization. So what this is going to involve is a simple L-shaped shelf that will go between the legs in the back and it'll be a little shelf that you could put the power strip on and everything can plug into it. Wires can run back and forth across and it should really, really help out. So uh, let's get that constructed. Just two pieces of walnut is all it takes for this shelf. I'll domino them together into an L shape and then domino them into the underside of the desktop. Even though few people will ever see it, it's worth it to finish this piece like any other part of the desk. Because the parts are already finished, I'm using polyurethane glue, which should have no problem binding to surfaces that have been sealed. And now the moment of truth. Time to set up the desks. I'm using double stick tape here just as a temporary hold. I could always attach that strip permanently later. Um, but I know at least for me, the first setup is almost never 
the final setup when it comes to cable management. Slowly but surely, I'll get everything installed and all those wires routed nice and cleanly through the channel in the back of the desk. All right, so here it is in its full glory. You know, admittedly, maybe a little bit over the top, but I don't want a light show here. I don't want a bunch of flashing lights and changing lights. What I really wanted was one color that I could match to the rest of the RGB in my system. And if I change my mind, I could change the color and everything kind of goes with it. So I wanted this sort of subtle accent. And the cool thing is when it's turned off, it just looks like a black inlay. So it's not a deal breaker, even if you don't use the LEDs in the future. Um, but I definitely think the shape, the size, everything is very serviceable. This is gonna last us a long time. And it already goes really well with the walnut shelf that I have, the PC sitting on. And then I have a floating shelf, actually two of them up here. Uh, those look pretty good too. Now, I actually have to put Nicole's desk together, so I'll, I'll definitely show you the final thing with the TV in place and everything, but I think this is enough to give you an idea of where I'm heading with it. So most of the cable management is done. I still have to perfect that, um, but man, once this thing is together, it's kind of hard not to just jump right in and start playing games, uh, which I think is what I'm going to do. And a big shout out to Doghouse Systems. They really helped me design a great system here. I don't have uh, time or frankly uh, expertise at this point to put a PC together like that one. And this one is great because it comes with a nice warranty. And that's very helpful in the world of uh, PC gaming. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed watching along. And thanks again to Doghouse Systems. Check them out at doghousesystems.com. And uh, if you're like me and you want a great PC, but just don't have the ability or time to go make one, uh, it's great to have folks like that who can build these systems for us. So thanks for watching. Have a great day. I'll see you back once all three of these are glued up. There's four. There's four, not three. <laughs> all right. So I've got three more of these to do, but it's a, the Jesus Christmas pants. I'm a professional. Well, I'm in my jammies. All right. This is a continuous duty pump that I bought a long time. Duty. Just realized I said that. So today I'm gonna to show you how I made this awesome gaming PC poopy on your butt. Try it again. And uh, oh, 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 o